Um, Lord Glenarthur, before I move on to my next topic with you, um, I just want to go back to the, the text of some of the statements that we've looked at on no conclusive proof. Um, and just explore with you what you said in um, your statement and what was said on your behalf to the Penrose inquiry were qualifications um, in, in, to that general statement. Okay? Yes. So if we look at... I, I won't go to the press release from, from Mr Clark because I can ask him about that. So I'll just okay. look briefly again at the fourth uh, statements that emanate from you. So if we start with... DHSC 0002229 underscore 085. This is the <coughs> parliamentary question. If we just go f slightly further down the page, Chomek. So if we just pick up that sentence above Baroness Dudley, although there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted by blood or blood products, and I think I read out the whole sentence previously, but I'll read it out again. The department is considering the publication of a leaflet indicating the circumstances in which blood donations should be avoided. Um, so having said no conclusive evidence, you go on to talk about the, the, the publication of the leaflet, and we explored that in detail yesterday. W would you accept, however, that's not a, a, an actual qualification that addresses the question of causal link or, or proof, is it? I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question. Um, let, let me try and put it more clearly. Um, what I think was said by you in your witness statement and was said on your behalf to the Penrose inquiry yes. is that when you look at the various pronouncements of no conclusive proof, yes. there is always something else that's said yes. um, that might have um, shown that nonetheless the, the, the department was doing something. Correct. Um, uh, and so we see here... We have the sentence that talks about the absence of conclusive evidence, no conclusive evidence. But then the sentence continues, the department's considering the publication of, of a leaflet. Yes. Um, it says what it says. It yeah. refers to the action that you're taking. My, my, my question to you is simply this. Um, what's recorded there as being something the department's considering is not in itself any form of express qualification to... The, uh, um, the line to take? It, it, you're not saying, for example, along Dr. Well, I, I, I think that it's a question of how one reads what is being yes. said, but at the moment it, it, uh, it reads to me, and unless uh, you, sir, have a, a, a different view of what you meant to say, but it looks as though you're dealing with, at first of all, what, what the evidence is, yes or no, to yes. uh, AIDS being transmitted by blood or blood products, and secondly, you're talking about action that's being taken in any event. Correct, and, and, and this was, this was um, uh, not me using my own words, um, although it was approved by me because it, it, was, the, it was the answer to the, that question which appeared in the brief that I was given, and I did not find any reason to dispute it. And, and as a matter of factual reality, the department was considering the publication of a Yes, it was, as time. we discussed at length. Um, in some detail already. Uh, and then if we go to... Um, the, the, the second document in, in, in chronological time, which is the letter to Mr Jenkins, DHSC 0002231 underscore 036. Uh, you say um, uh, um, in that second paragraph... I think that I should emphasise, firstly, that there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood products, full stop, and I've asked you already about that. And then you continue by saying, nevertheless, we're taking all practicable measures to reduce any possible risks to recipients of blood and blood products. Our scope for action in this is limited, as there's no means of testing for the presence of AIDS in blood donors or in blood products. So, again, is it right to understand that um, you, you, you're dealing in the first sentence with... Um, the, the, the issue of causal link, and then your second and third sentences are a statement of, of what the department is or isn't doing. That appears to be correct, yes. Um, and I've, I've explored with you already yesterday the question, not by reference to this expressly, but the question of whether there were other measures that could have been considered. I'm not going to go back over those. Uh, we'll come on shortly to consider the issue about the pre- and post-March plasma. Um, as whether that was yes, an area okay. where further action could have been taken. 
And then if we go to the third letter in time, um, the letter to Baroness Masham, DHSC 0002231 underscore 037. Uh, second page, third paragraph, we've got that first sentence that we explored before the break. There is, in fact, no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate or factor eight concentrates. And then you go on to say, and, and, I, and I will be coming back to, 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 to the substantive issue here, while no cryoprecipitate for therapeutic use is imported into this country, we are at present dependent on imports from the USA for about half our requirements of factor eight for the treatment of haemophilia. Uh, and then you refer to the issue of, of whether to ban the pre-March plasma. So again, you've dealt with, is this right? And please, if, if, if you think there's another way the letter should be understood, do, do correct me. You deal with the question of the causal link in the first sentence. Yes. And then you go on to explain the factual position in relation to um, dependency upon American concentrates. Um, and then to explain what the position is in relation to the FDA recommendations and the, and the department's response to them. That's what it looks like, yes. Uh, and then, um, last of all, if we look at um, the letter to John Maples MP, ARCH 40679, Oh, I'm asked to draw attention. Sorry, Shamit. Can we can we continue with this letter? Um, I'm asked to draw attention to the last paragraph, um, which refers to close touch with the Haemophilia Society. Um, it says naturally this is a yes. great concern to them, but they did not support the cries from some quarters to ban the import of factor eight because they accepted that the possible risks of infection from AIDS must be balanced against the obvious risk of not having enough factor eight. So I think I'm being asked to draw attention um, to the um, what could be said to be an acceptance there by you of possible risks of infection from AIDS. Yes, that is correct. And then um, the last document, um, the letter to John Maples, ARCH 0000679. Thank you, Shamik. You are, um, as ever, ahead of me. Um, if we look further down the page, so um, we've got that first long paragraph, which we, we looked at before the break, referring to anxiety, putting matters into perspective, cause of AIDS unknown, known, no conclusive proof. And then you're, uh, you continue by saying, nevertheless, I would like to assure your constituent that the government is committed to making this country self-sufficient in blood products, you go on to refer to the expenditure at BPL, the redevelopment underway, uh, and then um, uh, you go on to, uh, sorry, just pausing there. The redevelopment of BPL was, was of course, unrelated to, to the AIDS crisis because the decision was taken to develop BPL or redevelop Way BPL back, yes. before that. Um, and then it goes on to talk about dependency upon imports from the USA for an adequate supply. While there is as yet no test for AIDS, such imports will be subject to new regulations initiated by the US Food and Drug Administration designed to exclude donors from high-risk groups. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about future supplies uh, will be manufactured from plasma or collected in accordance with these regulations. There's still a quantity of stock which has been made from pre-March plasma. The FDA has recently decided not to ban the use of such stocks uh, because it would cause a crisis of supply. The same considerations apply here. And then uh, over the page... Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't worry. I was looking at the wrong document. That's fine. Bottom paragraph. Sorry, we are, of course, anxious to eliminate, to, minim to minimise the possible risk of transmission of AIDS by blood donation, uh, and then there's reference to the leaflet. Yeah. Um, so I've been asked to draw your attention to the, to the content or those aspects of the content of the remainder of the letters... Is there anything in those letters that you would wish to flag up, which, for example, record um, a view that, that AIDS is the likely cause of blood and blood products? I don't think we see that said anywhere, but I 
want to give you an opportunity to say anything you wish to about those letters. Uh, no, I think the letters stand as they, they are, and I, I've got nothing to add to those letters. Thank you. May, may, may I, I just ask about the, the use of the wording in the last paragraph? Um, what is being contrasted, perhaps, to the reader by the, the, the draftsman of this, and I appreciate it wasn't, it wasn't you, it um, is the, the no conclusive proof uh, that, it, that AIDS is uh, transmitted by blood or blood products. And then this is said, the, the possible risk of a transmission. And it set me wondering what the word possible added to the word risk. Uh, because as a, as a matter of fact, as I understand it, uh, on the evidence which uh, we've been through, the, uh, the view of the department was the probable situation was that it was transmissible through blood and blood products, whatever the cause was. So possible seems to be a rather odd word to use. Would you like to comment on that or not? Looking at it now, it does seem there's a contrast between probable and possible, and quite why it was written in this way, or quite why uh, I didn't pick it up at the time. I don't know. I don't think it was done with any intent. I think it was more drafting than anything else. Uh, and I don't know whether the same person drafted this letter as drafted some of the others. So there's a little bit of language uh, that floats about, perhaps slightly inaccurate. I, I, I don't blame you for this. It's it just a, yeah. a, a, a um, it doesn't entirely reflect what we understood the position of the no, department I, I, to be. No, I'm looking at it now. I, I, I agree, Sir Brown. So I want to come on then just to consider an, a, a little more, um, not, not, not a great length, this issue about pre- and post-March plasma. Um, and I think we can pick it up in terms of material that you'd have seen um, with the, the, br the briefing note or background note that you um, had asked the Chief Medical Officer for, which you received, I think, authored by Dr Wolford, at DHSC 000 Two three zero nine underscore one two four. We we looked at this yesterday. If we just go to the third page, we can pick up this particular issue under the heading haemophiliacs. Um, uh, it is thought that the greatest risk to haemophiliacs at present is from the use of factor eight concentrate prepared from American plasma. Uh, and then there is reference to the redevelopment of BPL um, and that until that is done, some 50% of the factor eight concentrate needed to treat haemophilia will have to be imported, mainly from the USA. And then it says this, in March of this year, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, instituted new regulations governing the selection of plasma donors, which were aimed at excluding as far as possible donors in high-risk groups. The department's medicines and supply divisions are endeavouring to ensure that there will be no dumping of high-risk plasma products on the UK market and are seeking various assurances from the manufacturers in relation to the quality of their products. It should be noted that certain commercial manufacturers are proposing to introduce heat-treated factor eight concentrate. There's no evidence whatsoever that such material reduces the risk of transmitting AIDS. Um, so th is, is it right to understand that th this will reflect your state of knowledge as at end of June, early July to 1983, when, when you received and you tell us in your statement, read this, this paper? Uh, exactly, yes. Um, can you recall any particular discussions that you had with, with civil servants, whether administrative or, or, or medical or, or, or in your private office, about this, this specific issue, the, the issue of a concern about the dumping of, of of pre-March concentrates? No, I can't recall any discussions about that. Um, now, you, um, we'll, we'll look at how it's then reflected in, in, in letters to Baroness Masham and, and Mr Jenkins in a moment, but can we just go first of all to your witness statement? And it's, I think, paragraph 37.3, yes, page 52. Um, yeah. You refer in paragraph 37.1 to the letter to Mr. Jenkins, and then in um, uh, 
in, sorry, let me read that out. I, I have been referred to my letter to Mr Jenkins, in which I stated that the government would adopt the same position as the US Food and Drug Administration by allowing the continued use of blood products manufactured from plasma collected prior to March 1983. And then you say, in response to specific questions, and in paragraph 37.3, this was current policy based on the fact that without continued use of pre-March plasma, there would have been a crisis of supply. I did not have any personal involvement in formulating this policy. It appears to follow from the recommendation of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines Biological Subcommittee, subsequently endorsed by the Committee on the Safety of Medicines, without being put directly to ministers for decision or approval. Um, so bef bef before we look at any of the underlying documents, um, I think it, it's pretty clear from your statement, but I just invite you to confirm um, that this question of, of what to do um, about pre-March pre um, plasma never came to you for a decision or for approval? No, I'm certain it didn't. And the first that I knew about the um, crisis, the, the phrase crisis of supply, in a sense, has been drawn from the documents that uh, I, I may have been told about it at the time, but, but certainly from the documents that I've seen since and CM, CSM and CSMB. Which, as we established yesterday, you didn't yeah, see at the time. I didn't see. Um, and, and, and I should say, say the beginning of top of the next page. You do you you say in paragraph thirty seven point five, there seemed no viable alternative, and that's based upon the information that you were receiving at the time. That's what I was told. Um, now, if we then just look at uh, um, what was said uh, um, uh, uh, on this issue um, in the correspondence. Um, if we can go first of all to the draft letter to Baroness Masham, um, it's DHSC 0001405. And if we go to the, the second page... Um, and we look towards the, the bottom half of the page. I think this is the point, sir, at which you'd asked if we were going to come back to this. So I'm coming back to it now. Um, uh, um, so we can see there um, set out, uh, we are at present dependent on imports from the USA for about half our requirements of factor eight for the treatment of haemophilia. In March of this year, the US Food and Drug Administration initiated new regulations for the collection of plasma designed to exclude donors from high-risk groups. Although future supplies of factor eight, both for export and for use in America, will, will be manufactured from plasma collected in accordance with these regulations, there's still a quantity of stock, some already in the UK and more in America, awaiting shipment here, which has been made from pre-March plasma. The FDA has recently decided not to ban the use of similar stocks intended for the USA market because to do so would cause a crisis of supply the same considerations apply to um, the uh, UK supply position. Um, and then I don't think the rest of this letter adds anything further on that particular issue. So it would appear that, that by this time, and this is sent to um, your private office on the 26th of August 1983, you are, as it were, you're not being asked to to take the decision or approve the policy, but you're being in, you're effectively being informed through this draft that that's the position that's been taken by the department. Is that right? That that is right. I mean, I, I, uh, I yes, I was being informed through this draft about that particular step, but uh, I can't add more to that. Um, and then. Well, just just rather than going on in time, can I just go, go, go back a month? Um, because I, this is to go back to DHSC 302309 underscore 032. We looked at it earlier. Let me go to the next page. This is something which was prepared by civil servants with a view to 
giving a, the, the draft reply which you in fact sent on the 26th of August. But I, I just want to ask you about what is said in the, the last sentence. Meanwhile, we have confirmed with American manufacturers that future supplies of factor eight for this country will be manufactured only from plasma collected in accordance with US Food and Drug Administration regulations introduced in March this year. These were designed to exclude from plasma donation donors from high-risk groups. The, did you understand, I, I appreciate you weren't briefed on this and you weren't asked to make a decision about it. Did you understand that before March, plasma, uh, which might have been um, to which, sorry, to which high-risk groups might have contributed had been used as a base material to make factor concentrate in the U.S.? I'm not sure if I did. I, I, I believe I may have been, but um, you, you mean... Mr. Well, I, I can take it more, more simply, perhaps, sorry. rather than rather than ask you to, to puzzle over this. Uh, th there were two classes of, uh, of product, pre-March, not, not as good as... Post-March, because post-March was safer and pre-March was less safe. Yes. So in order to ensure that the UK got the safer product, uh, we've seen, we saw with um, Dr. Walford that there have been uh, some discussions of contact, um, attempted contact with uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies. Yes. Um, it was proposed at this stage to, a sh to have you say, on behalf of the government, that, that uh, there, there had been confirmation from American manufacturers that future supplies would be manufactured only from plasma. Now, it doesn't talk about there being a backstock in, in the, the warehouse which had been made with the, the, Pre the riskier stuff. Yes. If I can put it in those terms, yeah. which was going to be sent anyway because it was already assigned to the UK. Um, this, this, if this draft had been sent out, it would have had completely the wrong picture, would it not? I, I think I'd really have to analyse that a bit more closely. With, I mean, I don't know um, who, who, who prepared well, I, the draft. I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, but... Well, but uh, uh, looking at it now... It, it does look as though there could be a conflict there. Yes. I, I appreciate that now. Uh, and by the time you get to the letter which is actually sent out, yeah. uh, there's a, a change, and, and the, the letter quite rightly says, well, there is stuff in the pipeline which yes. was made from the riskier, riskier material uh, which is going to come. Um, the, did you ever see this particular draft, these particular notes? Do you, do you remember? I don't. I don't think I did. It was a contribution to it, and I can't remember what the rest of it was. I mean, I, I, I cannot recall whether I saw it. it. It was very unlikely that I did see a draft. Well, I, I suppose if you had seen it, you'd have you'd have contrasted that with what you were then being asked to, to say in in August and said, yes. "Well, how how come that these assurances are, are no longer hold water?" Well, I think that's very possible, Sir Brown. I mean, the the, the I, I was taking quite a lot of trouble over this letter to Lady Masson because the. First, I think I'm right in saying that the first um, reply that I was given to send did not include various elements. One particular one was the question of cryoprecipitate, which I asked officials to go back and look at again and make sure that the letter was complete. Uh, so I, I probably wouldn't have seen this, but I'd have seen a final version which was unsatisfactory, uh, which I asked to be modified. And we've now seen that uh, we're a the suggestions there, not just in relation to this, but also in relation to uh, no conclusive proof, but which was eventually missed out on the advice of an official, uh, and I was given the draft that was eventually signed by me and sent off. So yes, I, I, I wouldn't have seen, I don't believe I'd have seen this particular draft. Yes. So what I'm to take from this is is. Is it uh, that in the department um, they were proposing that you should say something which may not have been accurate, uh, that it was 
reviewed and, and uh, you, you were given an accurate draft to, to send, a more accurate draft? I suppose that is the case, but I, I could certainly not be absolutely certain because I wasn't involved in the mechanism of decision-making at that level of providing the draft. Yes, I, I see. Well, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. Having made clear, as you do in your, in your witness statement, and there's no documentary evidence to suggest that you're wrong in that regard, that you had no personal involvement in, in developing this policy and that um, it appears not to have been put to ministers for approval. Um, do, do you have con any concerns about that now, that, that this issue was not um, uh, um, put with a, a briefing paper setting out pros and cons, for example, for ministers to decide? Uh, yes, on reflection, I do, and I, I don't understand why concern wasn't raised through the medical and clinical chain up towards the CMO, and the CMO being alerted to say, you know, this, amongst other things, the, this, um, the, 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 these are issues which are of sufficient interest and concern. Ministers ought at least to be aware and then able to discuss what, if anything, could be done about it. But I don't believe that ever happened. And, and we did explore in more detail with Dr. Wolford, who was more closely involved with some aspects of it, at least. Yes. So, some of the toing and froing with manufacturers and so yes. on to obtain information. There's no evidence that any of that came to your attention, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, I'll seek to explore that with you. Can, can I then pick it up, um, rather than do it by reference to the letter to Baroness Masham, I'm just going to do it by reference to the letter to M Mr. Jenkins although I, I, I don't think there's any great difference between the two in terms of substance. DHSC 0002231 underscore 036. We'll, we'll see um, if we um, now look at the paragraph the bottom of the page. Um, having referred to the, uh, the FDA... Um, well, I think what's consistently described as regulations. Um, and then uh, uh, um, it's then recorded as still a quantity of stock, both for, um, some already in this country and more in America awaiting shipment here, which has been made from pre-March plasma. So you would have become aware, whether seeing the draft for Baroness Masham or seeing the draft for, for, for Mr Jenkins, that as a matter of fact pre-March plasma was going to, to be used in the United Kingdom? Yes. Um, or concentrates made from pre-March plasma, I should say, to be more accurate. Then it says the FDA has recently decided not to ban the use of similar stocks intended for the USA market because to do so would cause a crisis of supply. Obviously, the same considerations apply here, and then it goes on to talk about the balance of, of, of risks. Um, and you... You, in fairness, I should say, you then set out your, your view that you think the decision is to carry on using the current stock is justified, and you make reference to um, manufacturers' own, own precautions. You, you've described for us the process of you, you get the draft, and if you agreed with it, you'd sign it and send it out. Do, do, do you think you probed civil servants at, at all as to whether in, in there was really... Um, whether it was true or correct that the same considerations applied here um, or, or asked to have details of what the, the reassurances there might be from the, the manufacturers about, about their own safety regimes? Or, or do you think you just assumed that the advice being given to you was the right advice? I, I had to take on trust what, what was being provided to me by way of um, documentation, a, a, a letter in this particular case. I had... Uh, I, 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 I think we were all heavily reliant on um, accurate drafting of letters replying to constituents or other people, in this case ASTMS. Uh, and so I don't think I probably did query it. But I think, in hindsight, uh, with more familiarity with it all, because I've read more documentation over the last few months than I've... Um, was aware of at the time in the department that uh, it, it, it probably ought to have been brought to minister's attention. We are going to have to use stuff which was dodgier, if you put it you know, in inverted commas, than the post-March stuff because otherwise we are going to uh, not have sufficient of this risky but 
less risky than no factor eight at all to treat p patients with, uh, which is what the United States are continuing to do themselves. Uh, and I, I, we established yesterday, I know, that you, you, you didn't see the decision of the Biological Subcommittee on the Committee of the Safety of Medicines. But if we just look at ARCH0001... Well, just, 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 just before we, we, we do that, uh, I just caught the, the top line um, uh, on the screen. Could we just scroll down a, a, a little bit to see what else? Yes, uh, it's the that second sentence of the, the second paragraph. We are taking all practicable measures to reduce any possible risks to recipients. And then, of course, you go on to describe, in, in very clear terms, how you are actually taking um, dodgier stuff because uh, because of the, the uh, circumstances you expressed. Yes. Um, is there any uh, any uh, tension between those those two between the principle that you're expressing and, and what do you say later? They put a very heavy weight on what's practicable, perhaps. Uh, I suppose I can conceive of, of, of a tension, but the, that did not occur to me at the time. I was relating the facts as I saw it and as I'd been briefed by, by officials, and, uh, uh, and so I didn't dissect um, this particular letter, uh, put it to pieces and ask for a redraft and ask all the questions that are now being put to me about, you know, suggesting that I, I should have done. Um, but uh, th this was prepared in that way. I mean, it, it seemed to me then, as it does now, that it was reasonable to continue to use, because we had to, pre-March material from the States. That, that, I, I'm not really asking about that. I'm just asking about the, as it were, uh, the, the draftsman thinking it appropriate to put in, in your, your, your mouth. And I know you looked at the letter and approved it, but, but you did so on, on, largely on trust, um, saying uh, we're doing everything we possibly can, and then saying, well, actually, we're not in this respect because we're having to, we're having to accept dodgier stuff yes. because yeah. there's no alternative. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so if we just look at the... Um, uh, Biological Subcommittee's decision of the 13th of July again, ARCH 0001710. So this is the minutes of the, the meeting on the 13th of July. And we go if we go to page three, paragraph 5.5. Um, so th this is how the Biological Subcommittee dealt with this pre-post-March plasma issue. It is advisable that all clotting factor concentrates derived from US plasma sources and intended for use in the UK be prepared only from material manufactured from plasma collected after new regulations were introduced by the FDA on March 23, 1983. These regulations were introduced specifically to minimise the likelihood of collecting blood from affected donors. This step is recommended, notwithstanding the possibility that its practical value may be relatively small, it cannot, however, be taken until supplies of post-March 23rd material can be assured. It is recommended that close contact is maintained between the licensing authority and supplies division with the aim of introducing this step immediately it becomes feasible. Um, now, of course, it, it, may, it, it may be argued um, um, by those, those involved that it never became feasible, but, and, 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 and that may be a matter that, that Sir Brian has to resolve. Um, but we can see here that the recommendation of the subcommittee, the primary recommendation, was not to use concentrates manufactured from pre-March plasma, albeit they recognised or thought, I should say, um, that that step couldn't actually be implemented um, until it was, uh, um, th th there were sufficient post-March supplies. So there's, there's a recommendation that that should be the primary position, a recommendation that there should be close contact between the licensing authority and supplies division um, with the aim of introducing this step immediately becomes feasible. Had you seen that, and we know you didn't, had you seen that, but however, would, do you think it would be more likely that you would have wanted to probe, test, challenge officials um, as to whether the position articulated in your letters to Baroness Masham and Mr Jenkins really were the only course left to you? I think it's very likely that that, that would be the case. 
but I didn't see it. No, you didn't. Um, can I move then to a, um, a separate issue, um, which is the issue of um, the introduction of a screening test for donations. Yes. In which you had some involvement, but the issue really then continued after you'd moved post in, in March of 1985. So I'm not going to seek to try and establish the full story through you because okay. you, you only had a, an involvement for a period of time. If we just pick it up at DHSC four zeros four four three, please. This is a briefing note dated the 31st of August 1984. We can see it, it, it comes to Mr. Joyce in, in your private office. And it says, the briefing note opposite has been prepared in collaboration with Dr. Smithers in response to the publication of the article in The Lancet dated tomorrow. As The Guardian ran an item based on that article in today's paper, Dr. Harris considers that Lord Glenarthur should have this available as soon as possible. So it would seem as though the trigger for um, uh, information being passed directly to you on this occasion is press publicity, and you've explained that's one of the circumstances in which ministers, ministers might become involved. Yes. And then, um, if we go over the page, we can see it talks about, um, oh, it's, a, it's headed publication of a paper in the Lancet, 1st of September in the Guardian, 31st of August, on the use of a screening test for AIDS devised by teams at the Institute of Cancer Research in the Middlesex um, Hospital. Um, I don't think we need to look at it in detail, um, probably just the summary. Ministers are aware from the AIDS leaflet submission that a blood test for AIDS antibody is under development uh, at the Middlesex and the Institute of Cancer Research. This background note provides further briefing to cover publication in the Lancet of a paper on the results of the use of this blood screening test. The title of the Guardian article and an unqualified statement that the HTLB3 virus is the cause of AIDS and PGL is misleading. Uh, the study does confirm the antibody to AIDS is prevalent in the homosexual community, etc. And then under the heading, the test, we can see reference to research workers having developed a test which detects in the serum of AIDS patients and others antibody to uh, HTLB3. Um, and then it goes on to talk about how that's been based on isolates obtained from Dr. Gallo's laboratory in the States. And further down, it refers to the work being done by Dr. Weiss and Dr. Tedder. So... It, it, I think it's right to understand if we look over the, uh, sorry, the last page of this document, we look at the heading conclusion. Um, you're being asked here, so you're not being asked here to take a decision. This is being provided to you for information. Is, is that right? That's what it appears, yes. So it, it doesn't have, as we see in the submissions or, or briefings that, that are asking you to take a decision, what, what that decision is. Yeah. Um, you're, you're essentially being updated as to this development because of the publicity. Um, if, if we then go to um, DHSC 0002309 underscore 052. Um, I'm not, not going to go through the, this in, in any great detail, um, but we can see it's the notes of a meeting on the 13th of November 1984, at which MSH, so Mr. Clark is present, but you're not. The, the, head of the me heading of the meeting is to discuss HCHS um, uh, um, reserves, and, and I understand that to be an abbreviation for Hospital and Community Health Services Reserves. Yes. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a discussion about the allocation of, of financial resources. Yes. And I think your statement tells us that that's no doubt why Mr. Clark was involved rather than you. That's correct. But I don't know if this minute was copied to me. I, I, yeah, without checking, I don't think I know the answer to that um, either. Um, if we go to the second page, um, and the, the, just the reason for, for uh, showing this, if we, if we look... Paragraph 4, top of the page, Little Roman 5, we can see there the reference to AIDS tests and the comment, hypothetically, additionally, should be expenditure for regions, not central preemption. Now, I, yeah. I'll, I'll ask Mr Clark about that, yeah. not you. Um, but we can see, in terms of the, the, the chronological narrative event, of events, there's a meeting in November discussing um, uh, central funding at which the, the, 
the possibility of funding for AIDS tests is discussed in the abbreviated terms we see here. Yes. Um, and you say in your witness statement that these types of financial issues were inevitably handled by the Minister of State, by Mr Clark, yes. rather than you or Mr Patton. Yeah. Um, if we then go to DHSC 3023309 underscore 116... We've got a minute from your private office, 15th of November 1984, to Mr Williams. Lord Glenarthur has queried whether we're now screening all blood for AIDS. If we are not, he would like to know when we will be able to and whether there are any problems associated with such an idea if the technology exists. I would be grateful for a short note by the 29th of November. So you're, you're trying to find out what the what pro progress has been made and yes, what the current just, state of affairs just is? just trying to inquire what was going on, where it had got to. And then we can see the response uh, is at DHSC 40436. And 26th of November 1984, Mr Williams to Mr Joyce. So this is a clearly a response to, um, to the minute we just looked at. We can see that in the first line um, where it records PSL. That's you asking for an update. Uh, next paragraph explains that the transfusion service is not yet screening blood for evidence of an AIDS infection. There's reference to the test having been developed um, and will be in use in a pilot trial. And then reference to arrangements being made with industry to scale up production of test reagents so that a British test is widely available for use as soon as possible. And, and then there's a question of, of what the cost of that might be. And we can see in brackets a, a reference to, to Mr Clark, MSH, having decided that allocation from central reserves would be inappropriate. Again, that, 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 that'll be an issue for Mr Clark, not you. But you're, you're, So you're given this update, effectively, yes. at 15th of no, uh, sorry, 26th of November, but not at a stage yet at which you're being asked to take a decision. That's correct. And then if we just follow it through to a draft submission then in January of 1985, DHSC 40562... Um, now, this is a draft from Dr. Smithers dated the 11th of January 1985, um, headed Screening Blood Donations for AIDS Antibody. CMO, that's the Chief Medical Officer, who yep. by now is, I think, Dr. Donald Aitchison, wished to consider this submission prepared with administrative colleagues for ministers to obtain approval in principle for the introduction of a screening test for AIDS antibodies in the National Blood Transfusion Service. Um, and if we look at the list of those who receive this down the bottom of the page, could, could you just... I, I don't identify from that any of the names I've recognised from your private office, but I might be wrong. Does that include your private no, office? No, none of my private office are copied into no. this. And it may be it's because it was a draft submission being shown to the CMO for approval. Quite yes, possibly. and I, I, d I don't think it also includes either Mr Clark's private secretaries or indeed Mr Patton's. Um, and then if we go over the page, um, and, and say so I think this is probably something I'll deal with in more detail with Lord Clark next week, but we can see um, uh, from the summary of this draft submission, this submission describes the public health problem that the spread of AIDS presents and the need to reduce as far as possible the risk of its transmission by blood and blood products it seeks ministers' agreement in principle to the introduction of a test to screen all blood donations for evidence of infection with the AIDS virus. Um, uh, um, and if we go then to page four, we'll see there what's set out is the decision that's required and the last paragraph, ministers are asked to agree in principle to the introduction of a screening test and to an announcement made to this effect. Um, at the appropriate moment. Um, now, as I understand the statement, and indeed as I understand the state of the documents, um, this is the draft submission. The final submission, which was dated the 15th of January, is another one of those documents that can't be located, um, which is why I bothered going to the, the draft yes, submission. Okay. Um, so I should say this isn't a matter which, which Lord Glenarth would have any knowledge of, we think we might have found a copy of, 
or found what happened to the final submission through some Welsh office papers, and it, it, it looks as though um, there's no real material difference between the draft submission and the final submission. But if necessary, I can we can try and res resolve that before Mr. Clark gives evidence, Lord Clark gives evidence next week. Um, if, if we go very briefly to DHSC. 00024820012 underscore zero one two. We've got a minute from Mr. Clark, dated the twenty second of January, nineteen eighty five, and, and I'm I'm looking at this with you very briefly because it's really a, a, a document for, for Mr. Clark. We can see it says thank you for your submission of the fifteenth of January. So I think this is how we. We assume the date of the final submission is the 15th yes. of January. If we go to the bottom of the page, I just want to look at the list of those who are copied in. We can see Mr. Joyce there. Yes. So it would appear, and, and I think this is the reconstruction exercise you do in your own statement, probable that the final submission went was, was copied to you as well as to, to Mr. Clark. Yes, it would have been, I'm certain. Um, did, did, again, th th there are then various documents one can trace through w w which lead to a... Um, I think a, a press announcement by Mr. Clark in, in um, the, the second half of February. Um, it, it, it tends to suggest that the, the ministerial lead on this issue was taken by Mr. Clark. It, is that your recollection? Do you recall having any detailed involvement with considering this issue? Uh, clearly, he had, he had um, strong views, and he also had um, a concern which he expressed in the bottom, do, do we need this and heat treatment of the blood? And I think I responded to that, um, saying that we, or I had at some point suggested that we needed both. We needed to know um, uh, uh, what was suggested in this minute, uh, this submission, and indeed, um, you know, what was causing it and how to treat it. And if we then pick it up, um, as I say, because I, I, I want to look at the underlying documents really with Lord Clark um, rather than you, if we pick it, pick it up most usefully with your witness statement, if we could have Lord Glen Arthur's witness statement back on the screen, Chamek, and it's page 71 of your witness statement. Page 71, Clark. yeah. Paragraph 59.1. You, you say that I've been asked to describe my role in the further decisions concerning the introduction of a screening test. Yep. And then you refer to some of the documents I've briefly uh, taken you through just to try and get the chronology um, understood. You then, um, further down in, in paragraph Little Roman 3, you refer to Mr. Clark's position, a response from the chief medical officer and so on. As I say, we'll, we'll look at all that next week. Um, if we go over the page... You refer in, in Roman paragraph five to, to uh, Mr. Clark's press release, and, and then you describe your own recollection um, in paragraph 59.2. With regard to the introduction of the screening test, I believe that I was kept aware of all developments, but I noticed that many of these documents were not copied to me. If I did make any decisions on these issues, none seemed to have been recorded, and decisions on funding would have been handled by the Minister of State. Mm -hmm. I cannot now recall whether I had a role in deciding which test should be used in the UK or when. I doubt that I did. Yeah. Um, and, and then you refer to Mr. Clark's announcement. Um, and then paragraph 60.1, you say, it appears from the contents and distribution lists of the documents listed above that my role in respect of decisions on the donor screening test was limited. It's difficult to say why this was so, but it may have been due to my other work in DHSS taking preeminence, and then you explain various other commitments you had. Um, and then, bottom of the page, you've said, I've been asked whether I agreed with the policy in respect of donor screening that was pursued. The answer is yes. With regard to funding, and whether it would be centrally provided or a matter for regional budgets to cover, funding was largely left to the Minister of State for Health to, to deal with. So that's really the limit of your involvement with the issue of the introduction of screening tests, is it? Yes, it is. That's correct. Um, can I then just briefly um, pick up uh, the issue about um, heat-treated products? 
again, it might be quickest to do it by reference to your witness statement because I think your 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 role again was was relatively limited. Um, so can we go to page the next page, Jamie? So it's page seventy three, Lord Glenarthur. Yeah, got it. Um, I think we can pick it up at the bottom of the page. Um, uh, where you you say I've been asked what role, if any, I played in respect of the following, and we go over the page, top of page seventy-four. Decisions relating to the prioritisation and/or development of heat-treated factor eight by BPL and/or the Protein Fractionation Centre. Decisions relating to the licensing slash regulation and use of imported heat-treated blood products by NHS patients, including by allowing the use of unlicensed heat-treated products on a named patient basis. And then you explain in the next paragraph, in relation to both of these, I do not recall being specifically involved. These were both technical areas being addressed, in essence, by clinical experts. I believe that an advancement in this field would have been left to expert bodies. I would have been expected to be informed of any issues in respect of which ministerial decision or intervention would have assisted. Um, and it doesn't look as though you um, were asked to make any particular decision or approve any particular policy or any funding in this regard. No, apparently not. Um, there was, however, an exchange um, uh, with um, the Haemophilia Society on, on an aspect of um, uh, heat treatment. So if we just look at that and, and the further meeting you had with the Haemophilia Society. So if we go to... DHSC 302251 We can see this is a letter dated the 28th of November 1984. It's from the Reverend Tanner, Chair of the Haemophilia Society. It says, I'm most grateful to you for agreeing to meet us on Friday, December the 7th. And we list below the points which we wish to discuss with you in relation to AIDS and haemophilia. Uh, and then the, the first is this, the principal point which we wish to emphasize concerns the heat treatment of blood products used by people with haemophilia. We note that Dr. Lane has stated publicly he expects the Elstree products to be heat treated from April 1985. Uh, and then in, in subparagraph A, the Reverend Tanner welcomes that but says there's a, that, that leaves a gap between now and April 1985. And then at paragraph C, we therefore urge that heat-treated commercial concentrates be introduced forthwith. Um, I don't think I need to refer you um, to any other um, part. Actually, just, just if, uh, one further part of this letter I'll refer you to if we go to the next page. If we look at paragraph three, just picking up on the issue we were just exploring, Lord Glenarthur um, screening... Um, we can see the Reverend Tanner saying we very simply urge the most speedy possible progress on this topic. We understand the test is in an advanced state of development and would ask that no financial constraints impede its progress to the stage of implementation. So you'd have been aware of the Haemophilia Society's view in, in relation to screening tests from this? Yes, I would have been, and so would the officials who no doubt attended the meeting with me. Um, so if we then come to the, the meeting on the 7th of December... 1984. Again, I don't think there's any record of that meeting, as I understand the position. D do you have any recollection of it, this, this second meeting? I don't have as much recollection of that meeting as I do of the first meeting, um, which was in the end of 1983, uh, if I recall. Uh, 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 no, and I, uh, uh, invariably notes were taken by officials as a, a memo of what had taken place and would have been placed on record, what had been said, the, 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 the balance of discussion uh, uh, at that meeting. Um, why it's not available now, I simply have no idea. Um, we can see then, however, you it was... Sorry, sorry before I, uh, we look at the letter, do, do you have any recollection of, of um, the mood of the meeting or the issues that were being raised at the meeting? Not now, no. Um, then if we um, pick up the letter you wrote to the Reverend Tanner after the meeting, we can at least get a sense of some of the topics that might have been discussed. DHSC 302249 underscore 015.
Um, so this is from you, 12th of December, 84, to the Reverend Tanner. Um, and you say, when we met on the 7th of December, I promised to write to you confirming some of the points I made at the meeting. Um, you you um, say that you appreciate and share your concern about the risks of AIDS to mm -hmm. haemophilia and, and refer to progress since the previous meeting. And then I just want to pick up what's said about heat-treated products. You say this, one of your main concerns was about the introduction of commercial heat-treated factor eight. Mm -hmm. I said that evidence of the efficacy of heat treatment in reducing the risk of transmission of AIDS has emerged only recently. The decision has been taken at BPL to heat treat their product commencing in April next, and existing commercial product license holders have been asked to make early application for variations in their licenses to allow introduction of heat treated products. Mm -hmm. I sounded a note of caution, however, that the regulatory authorities would need to be satisfied that any proposed heat treatment process was not only efficacious, but also did not introduce, in, to introduce new toxic risks. In the meantime, practitioners have discretion to prescribe unlicensed heat-treated factor eight concentrates on a named patient basis only. The choice of treatment is, of course, a matter for the judgment of the clinician responsible for the patient. The cost will be borne by health authorities in the normal way the department has not to date been informed of any problems in this score, or on the score. And then it goes on to talk about um, various other matters, including um, the redevelopment of, of BPL. Um, so, uh, I, I, again, I, it's a question of reconstruction from the letter yeah. rather than um, necessarily expecting you to be able to recall the detail, Lord Glenarthur. But it, would it be right to understand this as, um, as saying, in relation to commercial heat treated concentrates that was going to be left to clinicians to decide and the funding would have to come from the regional health authorities out of their budgets well that's what it looks like um yes uh, the um but, but but any commercially heat treated product would require approval of the necessary regulatory authorities yes and, I, and i'm not going to ask you to deal with what 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 process of licensing of the heat yeah, products, products might way. have been undergone yeah. because you, you don't, I think, would, you wouldn't have had any involvement in that. Uh, really, then just to, as it were, conclude the, the, this I issue um, in terms of the 84 interactions with the Haemophilia Society, if we go to DHSC 40684... This is a press release from the Haemophilia Society, and the context of it you'll see um, from that passage at the bottom of the page. This press release issued subsequent to the announcement that Scottish Factor 8 had been shown to be contaminated with HTLV3 virus is embargoed until one minute past midnight on the 20th of December 1984. Uh, just, just pausing there, look, this is an issue the inquiries had a lot of evidence about from the clinicians involved and the individuals involved. Do you recall it coming to your attention as the minister responsible for blood and blood products in England and Wales that it had been that it had been learnt that a number of individuals in Scotland had been infected with NHS factor 8 Scottish produced NHS factor 8 do you recall learning that No I don't recall learning that I don't remember anything about it and I don't believe I've seen anything in writing other than what's referred to here, um, to, to, to suggest it. I, 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 I certainly can't remember it now. Because it, it, it would indicate that certainly in Scotland, um, AIDS had penetrated the domestic blood supply, which would have been a cause for concern, presumably, uh, for the safety of the domestic blood supply in England and Wales. Um, so... Um, you're absolutely right. I'm not aware of any documentation, any particular no. documentation drawing it to your attention, um, other than possibly through this press release. But um, is it the kind of issue that you would ex say should have been brought to your attention? It may or may not have been as a matter of fact. Yes, it would, it would have been helpful to be aware, but um, it wasn't brought to my attention. And uh, I, um, I don't know to the extent to which it was brought to the attention of officials either. Uh, I, I just don't know the answer. I, I, we, we, we can no doubt explore that with other witnesses yeah. because I, 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 I don't think um, you're likely to be able to um, uh, assist us with ha how the Department of Health be became involved. I mean, certainly there's evidence of Dr. Smithers mm. b b um, ha having um, um, some knowledge of what was, what was going on. 
Um, if we just go over the page, then just picking up the one of the issues of concern to um, the Haemophilia Society. If we just go closer in. Um, the second paragraph picks up on the issue that uh, it seems the Haemophilia Society had been um, pressing at the meeting of the 7th of December. This underlines the very great urgency attached to the immediate introduction of heat-treated concentrates, which the Haemophilia Society has been pressing for since early November. We're disappointed that there appears to be a lack of urgency in the attitude of both the department and some of those who treat people with haemophilia, which means that heat-treated concentrates are only available to a limited number of uh, patients. Um, and then... Uh, it says in the next paragraph, whilst we remain of the opinion that treatment by prescribed medication is the first priority for anyone with haemophilia based on the firm conviction that haemophilia itself is more dangerous than AIDS. In the light of the recent development of heat-treated product, we urge our members to press for these concentrates at the earliest possible moment. We know that supplies can be imported very quickly given the willingness of the doctors and their regional finances. finances. The Society met with Lord Glen Arthur recently to discuss, amongst other matters, the provision of heat treatment, our understanding is that additional funding could be made available to any region which faces problems over meeting the additional cost involved. Uh, Society has also identified problems in the longer term over the supply of, pla of plasma to ensure self-sufficiency of blood products in the United Kingdom. Uh, and then there's a, a discussion about the possibility of a plasmapheresis programme and, and issues about the capacity of BPL, um, which I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, ask you to comment on. Um, and then the next paragraph says, um, as the representatives of over 5,000 haemophiliacs in the UK, we're not dissuaded from our view by statements that heat-treated concentrates should be further scientifically evaluated before they're introduced on a wider scale than that which they are currently available, viz. named patient bases. We believe that apart from haemophilia itself, there is at the present time no risk greater than AIDS. So um, the, 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 the Haemophilia Society appears there to be expressing a degree of disappointment over what's said to be the attitude of the department and some treating clinicians, which means that heat-treated concentrates are only available to a limited number of patients. Do, do, you, do you know if there was any particular action taken by the department or anything which came to your knowledge about the best way to, to respond to, to that issue? Not now, I, 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 I don't, but I, I was aware that um, this was a, a, if you like, a recent, a, a, a newish discovery that it was possible to heat treat without doing the damage that was suspected before. And naturally, there was a great deal of caution amongst clinicians to make sure that uh, uh, there were no uh, adverse effects from heat treatment. Uh, uh, and that would require the necessarily the necessary regulatory approval. I, I wasn't aware, um, well, I can't remember the, when I first came across the name patient uh, basis, which I think I've heard of since, which allows doctors under certain strict criteria to do stuff with, which has not necessarily re received final approval from the regulatory authorities. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just checking your statement, Lord Glen Arthur, to see whether there was any further document that um, casts any further light on, on, on that issue in terms of your own involvement, but I don't think no. there is. No. Um, and, and then uh, I think there was a suggestion by Professor Bloom of a meeting with you. So if we turn to MPNI 5037... Um, it, it's a letter from Professor Bloom, Chair of the UK Haemophilia Centre and Reference Centre Directors, um, dated the 4th of February 1985, um, uh, and um, uh, I, I don't propose to go through it in detail. He, he writes to you to ask if you think it might be worthwhile our meeting with you or a member of your staff in the near future we feel it may be advantageous to discuss the impact of AIDS on the management of haemophilia and related disorders. Um, the rapid changes that are resulting have already caused some difficulties, and the indications are that these will increase. The problems are not purely clinical. Equally important are those that arise with regard to the health and safety of staff, members of patients, facilities, families, and the general public. And, and then it continues in more detail. Um, 
the reason I'm not going to ask you about that in more detail, Lord Glenarthur, is that as I understand it, um, there was an agreement in principle by the Department that, uh, of a meeting between the Minister and, and, and um, representatives of UKHCDO, but then you left office and it was an issue taken up by, by your successor. Yes, I mean, I, 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 there's a, a note at the top of that. If we can go back to the letter, yes, please. Of course. Just take the, top uh, of the page. Uh, right at the top. Um, advice, please, as soon as possible. And, and and please arrange briefing to update me on AIDS because when what the date of this is uh, February, February. Five, I just wanted an update on where things were going. So yes, it was uh, put out for advice on what they wanted me to, what they suggested we should do. And, and as I understand it from the documents, it, it, again, please correct me if your understanding is any different, but this was the first time there'd been a suggestion of a direct meeting between you as minister and um, UKHCDO. I believe it is, yes. I don't think there have been any earlier ones. Um, so I've got a couple more topics to cover um, and some, some general questions for Lord Glenarford, but I note the time, so um, it might be the right time to break for lunch. Yes, so we'll take a break until 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. 2 o'clock. <laughs>